City Virtual Meetup. I'm Charles Fitzgerald, and along with Chris Kelly, who's at the Zoom controls, we are the organizers. Chris and I are technology enthusiasts and somewhat irreverent angel investors in Seattle. We're coming to you live and direct from Cloud City. That used to just mean Seattle, but in these extraordinary and unprecedented times, we've decoupled from geography. So now the capital city of the cloud is everywhere. And our mission is to talk to today's leaders and tomorrow's pioneers who are pushing the technology frontier. Our guest today is Bob Muglia. Bob has a long and distinguished software career. He's helped build some milestone industry products, particularly for managing data. He was the original program manager for SQL Server at Microsoft and later managed the Visual Studio Office and Windows Server divisions. He was president of Microsoft Server and Tools Division, which he helped grow to a $17 billion enterprise software business. He then owned software for Juniper Networks. Most recently, he was the CEO of the cloud data company Snowflake for five years, beginning in 2014. He's now a startup investor and board member. So our format for today is Bob is gonna take us through his perspectives on the modern data stack, how we got here, where we are now and where it's all going. That should take about half an hour. I have a few questions for Bob and then we'll throw it open. So to submit a question, please use the Zoom Q&A button. So Bob, thanks for joining us. Great, thanks Charles. Thanks Chris. I suspect people would rather hear from you than me. So take it away. That sounds great. Uh, look, I, I, it's great to have a chance to be here. Uh, Charles asked me to do this a number of months ago, and it seemed like the timing was right. Uh, since leaving Snowflake, uh, I've had a lot of different conversations with leaders in the, across the industry. And of course, I was pretty embedded in the data world while I was at Snowflake. And so I thought it would be useful to share some of the things that I've learned. A caveat to this is, you know, I was very involved in the design of the Snowflake product, so I have a high degree of affinity towards it. Uh, this will be an opinionated discussion, so if you, if if that if that bothers you, I apologize up front. But I think it's helpful for it to be opinionated, uh, but fair. I will focus on it being as fair as I possibly can. And um, then I, you know, I also wanted to say that that uh, you know, in addition to my history with Snowflake, I'm also a board member of, of a couple of companies, including Five Trend, which I will mention. So I wanted to just disclose that up front. Uh, one, uh, one, my sort of focus over my whole career in some places has been to build infrastructure of various kinds, certainly SQL Server, Windows Server, System Center, uh, and then of course, most recently Snowflake. This is infrastructure to help people build business systems more effectively. In essence, that's been my whole career focusing on that. And my goal is to make it better. Uh, uh, I, uh, I do think that, that, that leveraging solutions that are packaged solutions can save time and trouble and 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 but there are some times when that infrastructure isn't there and you have to build it yourself and i'll talk about that um so today what we're going to do is quickly i'm going to describe describe uh the modern data stack and i'll give you a history of uh and of what of where we've come from how we kind of got to where we are and then i'll really go into the details of the of the data stack and and talk a, quickly about the future so with that, uh, let's start with some fundamentals. Um, so what is data? I think it's worth starting here. What is data? And this has really been true forever. Data is a record of activity. It's pretty much that simple. And there are lots and lots of different sources of data. Uh, historically, data was created by people. Uh, people created data. They did it by filling out forms and, and, and doing transactions. Now more and more machines are great creating data. As you can imagine, machines can create a lot more data more quickly than people can. But the data that people create is very, very important. It often tends to take the form of transactions, something happening all at once that needs to happen together. You know, whereas machine data tended to, uh, generated data tends to be streaming in its orientation and append only. It, it's often called semi-structured and it, it, it tends to be append only. It's important to keep that in mind and I'll continue to make that distinction a couple of times through the talk. There are a lot of formats of data. I mean, if we go back in time, which is where I'll go in just a second, it was pretty much all structured data that was stored in some form of a structured database. That machine generated data in the mid 2000s that started being generated when the internet came about uh, took a different form. It was, not in, it was not in the form of rows and columns. It was what's called semi-structured, which has a hierarchy and machines want to output different kinds of data at different time. And again, it tends to be streaming in its orientation. And then probably more recently, we're 
we're beginning to make use of what I call complex data. A lot of people call this unstructured data. I think that's a misnomer because clearly there is structure to this data. In fact, it's very obvious for people to understand the structure. You, you look at a document, you understand the structure of that document. A computer has trouble with that. A computer struggles with understanding that structure unless some kind of advanced analytics and machine learning algorithm is applied to it. And what's changed in the last two or three years is we can now use computers to pull data out of the contents of these complex documents and make use of it. It's incredibly useful, whether that's transcribing, a, a transcribing this talk or, or whether it's, it's trying to, have, to pull, pull data out of important documents or look at medical images and discerning uh, problems that exist in medical images. All that becomes possible now because some of the things that advanced analytics are doing against this very, very interesting set of data that, that I call complex. Data has flows across systems. Now this is a modern view of data. This has not always been the way it is. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but we, if you look at the flow of data, it's interesting. It, it's, it starts with now. I could say data is a record of what's happening and it starts in the present and then it flows and it kind of has to flow through a pipeline of some kind. It flows towards the past and it must be stored in some kind of historical system of record. And I think of those as historical systems of record that can work with in query data. And then you can use that data to perform advanced analytics on it and predict the future. So the pipeline of, of data flow is really from the present to the past, where it is then used to predict the future. And I think that's a very interesting viewpoint and it reflects pretty much everything about the way people are working with data today. Now, let's, it hasn't always been that way, as I said. So we're going to go back. We're going to start back at the, at the beginning uh, of where, where data systems began. And it makes sense to start with IBM because IBM was the king of, of information infrastructure in the 1960s. And they really, were, they really did a large part of the early critical work in data models and data systems. The first major data system that came out was IMS. Um, it was built to, by IBM uh, in the mid-60s to store the parts list of the Saturn V rocket, which had millions and millions of parts and they couldn't track it any other way. That was a hierarchical database. It really was basically what's often called an ISAM database, but then it, you know, it became hierarchical. And then over time, we saw that advance to have more types of navigational pointers attached to it. And there were a number of databases that appeared in the 1970s that were of, of a variety of network forms uh, co often called CODASIL, and they, they, were, they were frequently used with COBOL. Colonet was the key to this at the time. It was eventually bought by CA, and they, the product of, of importance was IDMS. I did a little bit of early work on networking databases. I didn't do too much work on IDMS in the early days, but my, my beginning of data sort of began in the 1970s. But while all this was happening, in, in 1970, probably the most interesting thing happened in the late 60s in 1970, E.F. Codd, who was a researcher at IBM, uh, uh, invented re the relational algebra and the relational calculus, which is really a complete mathematical model. It's essentially a superset of linear algebra. It adds, it adds the additional dimensions of relations to it. Uh, and, and that mathematical foundation has been the basis of a great deal of the database work that has happened and certainly everything is, that has happened around relational and in particular SQL databases, which are a particular, a, a particular type of relational database. The most popular one uh, is all based on that. And that work happened at IBM as well. It, it started in 1977 uh, with the release of System R, which was the first SQL database that was released. And, and really that set the pattern for databases in the years to come. And remember, in this time frame, there really was no distinction between analytic and operational systems. There was just one application and database, and it typically all ran on one mainframe and um, was all integrated together. And so while that thing was happening in the big iron and all those things that were happening, um, I was kind of a youngster. I was uh, uh, in my, I believe, my sophomore year of college. And I, uh, I, I got a job um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan at a company called Condor Database. It was located in Ann Arbor. Uh, it was an interesting job. It was a consulting job of uh, building uh, database applications uh, on these Kremenko CPM microcomputers with these eight inch floppy disks. And perhaps the most notable attribute about, about this, this situation was I was building really pretty complete, simple with not a lot of data, but pretty complete systems 
um, uh, using, using Condor, which is a relational database. It's not SQL, but it was relational. It had verbs like join and project and merge in there. And it was very batch oriented. And, uh, and it had 16K of memory at first. And it actually kind of worked at that. It started working a lot better when we got 32K machines, but it, it sort of gives you an idea where the world was back then. Well, Condor didn't go very far, but uh, this gentleman certainly did something pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. Ellison with Oracle um, in the 1980s, started in the 70s, but really in the 1980s, uh, uh, really popularized SQL. And it made SQL really the dominant um, environment for databases really for many years to come. And with that, largely, we saw the first time relational replaced another type of, of, of data model and we moved from navigational systems. It, 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 well, these, by the way, the, the legacy systems never go away. There's still IMS systems running. There's still code still systems running, but nobody would, would do anything new on those. Even in, even in the 1990s, they weren't building a lot of new stuff. Um, things had moved to, to SQL and whether it was Oracle or DB2. So SQL and relational uh, won that battle. And really Larry was, Larry give him credit for, for, for largely driving and making that happen. Relational does scaling issues though. It's always had, it's historically had significant issues with scale because that math that is required to perform those, those calculations requires a lot of memory and the machines are somewhat limited and the algorithms at the time had some limitations. And so we saw people try and overcome that. One of the first ways they tried to overcome that was with multidimensional arrays, uh, which was not relational in its nature. Cognos was a really uh, successful early example of this. Um, and it, it saw some it saw some early success, but pretty early on we saw uh, uh, te really Teradata separated the analytic database uh, from the operational database, and and defined the generation of SQL data warehouse that was to really dominate analytics uh, for quite a few years. And we saw from that new players emerge in the BI space, most notably in the early days, MicroStrategy, which had a very strong early position in there, as well as a little bit later on Tableau, which of course you know, remains and, and, and continues to be one of the major tools people use today for doing BI analysis. So, so once again, once again, we saw we see SQL you know, replacing multi-dimensional. Multi, multi and and the, the, thing that, uh, the thing that's interesting here is that, uh, uh, there are still some challenges with uh, the scalability of these solutions. Uh, uh, separating the analytics was very helpful, but it did not solve the problem by any means in terms of scalability. And, and scalability issues continue to dog on-premise uh, data warehouse systems. And one of the ways people did that is they put some type of, of, of uh, OLAP cache in front of it. This is really relational. It's different than multidimensional um, online analytic processing. This is really relational analytic processing where you have a relational SQL database underneath that performs the SQL queries and then allows you to do caching in front of it so that you don't have to hit the database. We saw this a lot at Snowflake. Uh, I talked to one very large Teradata customer early on that made it clear they never let any of their end users touch that database. They always put caches in front of it. And certainly almost everywhere we went where we saw Microsoft um, and SQL Server, we saw SSAS in front of it, which I guess I'm kind of proud of because I had quite a lot to do with the creation of that product. A number of other people obviously really built it, but I, I, I sort of helped to make it come, come to life. So I feel good about that and people are still using it a lot, but it is time for those things to, to go away. The time has come. Meanwhile, a couple of other things interesting happened. In the mid 2000s, these, these uh, internet based systems started throwing up this massive amount of, of semi structured uh, uh, machine generated data that, that Teradata and, and Natiza and other data warehouses at the time simply couldn't handle. They, they only could work with structured data. And so Hadoop became the system that people used. Hadoop was very problematic. Um, it, you know, I don't think it has, it's gonna have a, it has had a long lifetime. It's sort of in the dying stages now. Uh, and, and what really, really replaced that was the cloud data warehouse and the work that we did at Snowflake. Um, that was a lot of our early business at Snowflake was Hadoop replacements. Uh, we saw really, you know, we saw Hadoop replacements and, and then a lot, of, a lot of migrations from Redshift that drove, a lot, drove our growth. And both of those are scale issues. Those are both examples of scale issues. The, the way MapReduce worked with semi-structured data and Hadoop was quite inefficient. 
And so we could operate at many, many times the efficiencies. There were queries that, see, that Snowflake was 50 times faster than Hadoop at, and that was not uncommon that our customers saw that. And so Snowflake was a much more natural solution for working with that data, and it, it, it found ways to extend SQL to work with semi-structured data. At the same time, it overcame the performance limitations in terms, because of its cloud architecture in terms of both data sizes, the ability to handle literally multi-petabyte tables, as well as uh, the ability to handle an unlimited number of simultaneous concurrent users were really the things that propelled Snowflake into the strong position that it's in today. And, and that concurrency was something that nobody else had. And, and, and of course it's, it was inherent in the architecture and it's possible to do in the cloud. The cloud really opened all this up and made many things possible that, that simply were not possible. So that brings us to, to where we are today with these modern data systems. And it brings us back to this picture of the data flow between operational systems to which are the present, the now, to historical systems, which are the past, and then using predictive analytics to define the future. There's important attributes to each one of these stages. I'll talk a lot about the historical and, 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 and predictive stuff, and, but also I just wanna take one second to talk about the pipeline. There are a lot of ways to do pipelines. People, by far the most common way people move data is with Python. People use Kafka, they use all kinds of tools, Informatica, many, many tools. There's a new generation of, of tools, which I'll talk about in a second, that are services that make this easy. But the thing I wanna point out that's very important about this data flow is the challenge in this that companies have very often is doing it in a, in a way that is both effective, cost effective, and is easy to operationalize and doesn't fail. Failures are very problematic in these things because they can cause data corruption that is difficult to recover from if, there's a, if, the, if, your, if your loading process fails. So the thing that's most important about that pipeline is that it have the attribute of idempotency to it. What that means is an idempotent process is a process that if you run it again, it will be self-correcting. And as they say, Data loads fail frequently, so simplifying the correction of it is important, and idempotency makes that particularly easy. And so that attribute is something to look for and build and think about when, when, when building pipelines. Almost never do people build it when, do that when they build it by hand, so they have problems down the line when there are failures. Um, what's, what's happening now is that this pipeline is being used to build a whole new generation of applications that are often being called data apps or data applications. These are applications. A data app is an, is an app that uses data together with predictive analytic services to autonomously take some form of action, to, to do something on behalf of the business. It can be as simple as alerting. That is the simplest form of a data, of a data app, but there are many, many much more complex forms of them that are beginning to appear. And I predict that this is a huge part of where companies will be going in the future is focusing on building these data apps. A large part of the story today is the tools and the systems and the infrastructure to build data apps sucks. It's terrible today. It's super, super nascent to do this. And one of the changes I see happening in the next three years is the maturation of the infrastructure. And I see everybody kind of coming together in a similar way to do that. All of the major players are, are really doing that to focus on simplifying the process of building data apps and simplifying the process for data scientists to discern what needs to be done. And of course, the business to work with data. Now, when you look at this from a workflow perspective, you know, you can break this down into different teams and different and different efforts. You have application developers building proprietary applications, or perhaps more likely, you're actually acquiring the application from a SaaS vendor. Most apps, of course, are supplied to their supply today are SaaS apps that are acquired and, and subscribed to. However, almost every company is building some set of, of bespoke and very important business applications, and those are the ones they often focus on. There's the data pipeline that needs to, to get the data to where it, it wants to go. And, and that is usually the, the, the job of the data engineer. And typically the data engineer is also the one that does the data model, that prepares the data model 
um, in, the, upon which the business analyst works. Often that engineering and, the, and the, the business side work very closely together on the development of the data model, but the concept of putting data in some form of SQL oriented schema, whether it be a star schema, a data vault, whatever modeling approach you may want to have, there are many, many different choices. You now have the flexibility to do that with, with modern systems. And, and again, it's often the data engineer that works together with the business to do that. Business analysts look at that data and, and they work with, with, with the data in the business. And you know, almost very often I will point out that business analysts frequently are working with financial data. And financial data is where transactions become very important. So I'll talk a little bit more about transactions in a minute. Trans I very, think it's a very important thing to keep in mind. And then we have you know, the data scientists that are really looking at how to build these predictive, out, uh, predictive systems and then working with various forms of developers to build these, these new data applications. And they typically are working with a data frame. I mean, they're typically working with Python or Scala or some sort of procedural language, working with data that's been presented to them in, in kind of this screen door format of, of, of a data frame that's provided by, by an environment like a Spark environment. Now, there are a couple of ways to get to there where you want to go. First of all, you can build everything yourself. Every part of this can be built with, you know, with little more than the tools that, you know, there's plenty of tools available in the cloud. Certainly vendors like, like Amazon have a whole plethora of different services available for you to put together your own solution. And it works. You People have been doing this for years. And there are some situations where you have to do this yourself. Um, you know, very often people really, there is no better choice for to build a data pipeline, except if you built a bespoke system, maybe you want to maintain and own that data pipeline yourself. And so you, you're, you're using, you know, you're using whatever tools you want there. And then people often will put data in some form of a data lake um, and then, then have a whole set of tools around that. Uh, there are cases where that's the only thing you can do. In particular today, if you're working with complex data, images, documents, videos, you pretty much have to build it yourself. You pretty much have to build a data lake because the, the systems don't do a very good job of supporting it. And really all a data lake is, mo it to is today is modern cloud storage like S3 together with whatever set of tools your, your, your people want to use, your engineers and your scientists want to use. Spark, you know, Presto, whatever sets, whatever sets of, of Airflow, whatever sets of tools you might want to use there are available. I highlighted one little paper here, which just appeared two days ago, which is uh, Kafka is not a database. Um, and, and that's a blog that was recently written. Streaming is, is people are talking a lot about streaming analytics. There are scenarios where streaming analytics makes a lot of sense. There are some where it doesn't make sense. Um, all the, the scenarios where people are doing eventing associated with operational, operational data, that's pretty interesting. Whenever you start dealing with end users and transactions and business data, it gets a little bit more complicated. And I thought this was a good paper and it was worth referencing so people have an idea of some of the things, the gotchas when you start going down some of these paths. Everything can be purchased as things that are a service these days and everything can be purchased as a service. And I recommend, it is my recommendation that if, if you can purchase something as a service, and it can work for you, you should do it. It will get, you will get a lot of value out of it. So, you know, obviously you can, you can acquire quite a bit of your business systems today through SaaS and everybody's doing that. The pipeline tools are getting quite sophisticated. You know, I've been very involved in Fivetran. I like what they're doing, uh, but you know, there's a number of tools like Matillion and Stitch that are also in the same, in the same category of trying to build modern service oriented pipeline tools. And then we have the data platforms. And really today there are separate data platforms, historical and predictive, and people put those two things together. They often mate them. The industry is merging that. Every single one of these big vendors, and I see it as really a five vendor, five vendor struggle right now. Snowflake and Databricks together with the three big cloud vendors, Microsoft, Google, and, and Amazon. Those are the ones that are fighting it out and all of them are moving to some form of a common data platform. Um, this is an eye chart, I know that. And, and you, it's something you might wanna look at later in the uh, PDF. This is my, my sort of view of, of, of where the world is today and the pluses and minuses of each of these, of each of these solutions. I'll quickly go through each one of them. 
Um, I said, I'm, you know, I said my bias is towards Snowflake. Uh, Snowflake is, is, I think, the, 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 you know, the, the preeminent historical system today. There are some things it does not do. It does not handle uh, predictive analytics in an integrated way yet. That is in beta. They are building that. It is still not ready. I mean, it's coming. You know, I, I believe those guys will get something significant next year, but it's not there yet. And you really need a predictive solution together with Snowflake. Um, so that's that's you know one major thing, and and it, what that means really is it doesn't really handle complex data very well. Although Snowflake will be also introducing some features to do some very very interesting things with complex data. Um, Snowflake also has a data sharing environment that's quite unique and, and is is very powerful for a number of scenarios. And I'll talk a little bit of that in a second. Google's the second one. I think Google is the second best platform out there. Uh, if I weren't going to build something on Snowflake, I'd probably build it on Google. Um, Google is very is is also very opinionated. You have to put a Google head on. You have to put your Google head on to do things. But people succeed with Google. The biggest thing about Google is it doesn't support multi-statement transactions, and I don't understand why they don't fix this. Uh, it's a pretty big miss because it makes it really hard to to when you're syncing data into BigQuery. It makes it really hard to do that in a consistent way. It just makes things a lot harder. Um, Next one is, is Databricks. Uh, people build some of the most sophisticated things on Databricks, and they have the best predictive, they have some of the best solutions for predictive analytics. Their historical system is relatively nascent. It's this Delta Lake, Delta Lake solution that they have. They also don't support multi statement transactions, which is a big problem. And then people tend to spend, you know, it, it tends to be costly to operationalize Databricks. People struggle a bit. The data scientists do great, and yet people struggle a bit with operationalizing this. Azure is a good solution for the for the for the, the sort of more mid market upper mid market customers. People do less with Azure, but they they do tend to succeed. And while there are some serious problems in Microsoft's current implementation of its data stack, they are fixing it. Uh, they are on v2 right now, essentially, of of their thing. Their first one was SQL Azure Data Warehouse. The second one was the first release of Synapse. My prediction is Microsoft will get quite a bit of this right with the third release, and they'll be pretty they'll they'll build a pretty decent platform. Although it probably will not be a best of breed platform. Um, AWS has just a lot of tools. It's a bag of tools. It's got a whole lot of tools. You can do anything with AWS, but you're going to do a lot of it yourself. So it's a little bit more costly to use, in my opinion. Also, Redshift is, is somewhat of, an, of a challenge for Amazon. Um, it was a perfect product from Snowflake's perspective in the sense when I was building Snowflake, in the sense that Redshift worked well enough so customers could seed with it. But every, for every customer, it would have a scaling issue. And, and so they would ultimately have a problem and move to Snowflake. So it was a perfect lead generation vehicle for us. Um, and it still is a problem for them. So that, that remains a challenge. And then finally, there's the build it yourself option if you want to go down that path, which again, you can do anything and sometimes you have to do it, for example, if you're working with complex data, but it's the more expensive option. The things in gray, the cost things are subjective on my part. So you know, people will quibble with it. That's fine. Your, your, your mileage may vary, but it's a pretty good indicator of what I see when I talk to different people. And the reason, by the way, I put the subscription costs for all the cloud vendors at, at just $2 signs some people say like BigQuery looks, published prices are pretty expensive, but they give discounts. So you should, anytime you're working with the cloud, you should work with the discount, you should get the discounts. And I think you can always get it. If you're the right customer, you can always get a discount there. So I, I put the pricing a little lower. This is my view of the best to breed in 2020. This is sort of where we are. You know, you work with SaaS systems, you build your proprietary systems of record, work with Fivetrend where you can, because Fivetrend will pull in whatever, whatever you need. And then if you need to build some, some, some pipelines yourself, do that, but hopefully you don't have to do too much. The, the, the transformation process can happen within the cloud data warehouse and, it, and, and that data can be used by both data scientists as well as, 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 as for, for data applications and for all kinds of business analytics and predictive analytics. DBT is a tool that has emerged as a way of doing these transformations and, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's been pretty important. And so we're now seeing a shift from building from procedural logic that's being used as a lot, was historically used for doing transformations to load data, largely to data being loaded directly into the data warehouse and then transformed using tools like DBT within the data warehouse for later analysis and, 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 and predictive analytics. 
I brought, I put a slide in on data mesh because I'm hearing a lot about it from a lot of people and there's some interesting ideas in here. And I put a link into a new paper that just appeared a few days ago that talks about this that I really, I really like. And that's because that paper focuses not so much on the implementation of the data mesh, but focuses more on the logical uh, uh, organizational structures of data mesh, all of which I agree with. I mean, the idea of having domain orientation, having ha treating data as a product, the fundamental ideas of the data mesh, I'm very, very much in sync with. But I think it's important to separate the implementation for it. There's a number of different implementations that are possible. Initially, they proposed ones that were more focused on streaming analytic solutions. You can just as easily build a fully functional and separated domain separated data mesh using Snowflake data sharing and their internal data exchange products that, that, that companies are using. So there are different ways to achieve this and it's really worth thinking about this from a logical organizational basis. So now here we are, you know, in 2020, we have a lot of data solutions and a lot of them look good, but there's still some problems. Um, in particular, there are that although cloud data warehouses solved a lot of the scaling problems, there are scaling problems and, and just, just logic problems that still exist. There is a number of solutions where, which are often called graph that people are trying to are using products like Neo4j or TigerGraph to solve. Those are navigational products. Um, they have many challenges associated with it. However, none of the sol SQL solutions solve that problem. And then we have complex data again, which can really not be solved in any way, you know, in any material way within the database. Where's it going? I think that relational wins again. I think in the future, and this is a this is I'm I'm way out there on this. Uh, I'm you know the the world would probably not say what I'm about to say. However, I think the future is relational knowledge graphs, and relational knowledge graphs will replace the graph and complex uh, model the way we're working with graph and complex data today. And in there's some interest. This is still nascent. I think we'll see SQL dominate for the next five to 10 years, but within the next five years, there'll be a new languages emerging that are more based on relational calculus that, that allow you to work with data in a fundamentally new, different way. And that really is, is knowledge graphs, moving to, to, moving, to, moving to knowledge graphs that are relational based. An entirely new generation of, there is an entirely new generation of algorithms that, that work with data, that, that leverage the relational model and work with data in a completely different way. You can learn a bit about those algorithms from these two, these two different places. Liquid is a database that was developed at, at uh, LinkedIn as a part of Microsoft, and they use it uh, for, for, their, for, their, for their knowledge graph that they've put together for people. And, and it's a really good graph-oriented solution, leveraging some of these new, uh, they're called uh, worst case optimal join algorithms. And then another company, a company I've been spending some time with uh, relational AI has been working on this problem. They're also uh, thinking about it from different perspectives, including the perspective of how, how these relational knowledge graphs can take on a number of the machine learning scenarios. So that's where I think the world is, is going and, and you know where we are. And, and uh, with that, I will pause um, pretty good on time and uh, I will pause to take questions. Thanks, Bob. That was great. I mean, there's a super interesting degree to which what's old is new and what's new is old in software. Um, I guess it would be safe to describe you as a relational maximalist. That would be fair. I mean, I, look, I, I, you know, I started my first uh, real focus. I mean, I started in the navigational world and I saw the challenges of that in the 1970s and into the early 1980s. And then I had the opportunity really to learn about and focus on, began focusing the relational database when I started at, at Microsoft. And it just, and, and over time, it just seems like that model wins again and again. And I see how it's gonna win. I mean, I see, and it's because it's mathematically based and most of these other solutions are not. So over the last decade, we've seen a ton of non-relational databases popped up under the, mostly under the banner of NoSQL. Um, do you think relational uh, eats those? Do the data lakes just dry up like the RLC? Well, you know, the, 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 there's different, the different questions there to some extent. The data lake is, is, is the only place you can store complex data right now. 
So as long as that's true, then the data lake will be present, but that won't be true for much longer. I mean, the Snowflake guys have already talked about implementing transactionally consistent blobs where they can actually, they'll be able to transact metadata stored within the database together with blob and blob is just another data type. And, and so that's a huge application opener when you can transact the metadata together with the actual data together. Um, but uh, th that problem, you know, that, that's one problem that, 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 that forces the data lake to exist. You know, the other thing to remember is that new data types, data types people want to work with emerge and then people build non-relational databases and they find ways to, to, to build relational databases later when the algorithms catch up. And we've seen that even, you know, even if we look at how semi-structured data is working. I mean, the, the case for relational catching up looks like it's played out multiple times. Um, the, the vendor assessment was super interesting. I mean, when we talk about this platform for data apps, do you see room for new entrants to provide new platforms? Or is it really just going to be those five companies you mentioned extending their platforms? Well, you know, when you look at what those five companies are doing today, they're all converging on building the same thing. You know, they're building a, they have a, a, a SQL database that they'll use as the historical system of record and can perform a variety of transforms. Then they'll have modules that can be written in procedural languages like, like Scala or Python, both for transformation if you want, but then also to perform advanced analytics and machine learning. Those will be integrated into one system with a data flow across those. That's the picture that, 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 that's emerging. That is a hybrid picture. I kind of call that the Prius architecture. And that's sort of the way I think about it. You know, I foresee an architecture where that entire stack can be handled with relational calculus and through, through the, and the, the full math. It turns out it is possible relationally to superset most of the, of the math that is used within the predictive analytics um, in, today's, in today's machine learning. And I think we're going to see that. Now, that's a way out there position, however. I know I'm, I'm, I'm in the the far fringe on that one, but it is where I see the world going. It's good, good to have an opinion. So Oracle's not on that list. I mean, they're a company that, that has some database chops still. Um, why don't you see Do them they? at that battle? Do they actually? I, mean, I guess I, they, they, I, you tell me. Do they? I don't know. It's interesting. Oracle is, you know, Oracle has not advanced their database capabilities materially, um, you know, in, for a long time. And, uh, and you know, my team, from Snowflake came from Oracle, right? The, the team were all, the original team were Oracle. So we had a lot of connections to Oracle. And I, I don't see Oracle modernizing and building the cloud database that they need to build. They continue they to- have some, some limitations on the cloud cloud front too, so. Yeah, I mean, how, whatever, whatever, I've never been a big fan of their cloud, but, but, but I'm a very non-fan of Exadata in the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost a non sequitur, really. I mean, it's like military intelligence, really. Yeah. All right, well, we got a bunch of questions here. So let me see if I can relate these accurately. Data mesh and knowledge graph seems to come together, but really not clear why relational again. Could you speak to why there isn't a gap for a different approach such as data log, which is logical and mathematical? Uh, well, first of all, when I talk about relational and, and I talk about where I think the relational knowledge graph goes, it's really, it's really the evolution of data log in essence. And if you look at what happened, the, the, the people who are doing this were playing with data log 25, 30 years ago. So, I mean, and, and what's fascinating actually is we saw a period, there was a, it, the, the period of data log had a quick, a relatively hard end. I believe Stonebreaker had a quote on it at some point in time, where which was 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 a very negative quote, which really took a lot of the air out of the sails of the people in data log. And I see a resurgence of that. So I think it's in a way that approach of using re, it's a relational calculus approach. And one of the things, Cod's theorem um, from from I believe 1977 um, said that relational calculus, which is declarative, it has variables and it can appear in any order can be, can be uh, uh, transformed into relational algebra, um, which, is, which is also what SQL is transformed. SQL is a query language that's transformed into relational algebra. So I, I actually think these things are quite, quite similar. And, and yes, there is synergy between data mesh as an organizational concept and relational knowledge graphs. There's a lot of strong synergy there. Sorry, the questions are moving around so fast, I can't, I can't find them. Um, 
me go over to the, the other page here. Um, can you explain why Google BigQuery is more operationally expensive than Snowflake? Well, the chart, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the reason I would say it is because they don't support, they don't support multi-statement transactions. So loading data in is, is a bit more complicated. And, and a lot of that comes from my comments from the Fivetran guys who use BigQuery as their, as their primary data, data uh, engine. And they know Snowflake inside and out. And you know, they said, hey, they decided to work with BigQuery because it was just harder to work with. And they thought it was more useful for them to learn that. Um, which, which I applauded in their case uh, for what they're trying to do, which is su support their customers. But I will tell you, Google, people succeed on Google. They, they do succeed on Google. Can you clarify what you mean by subscription cost versus operational cost? Sure, the cost you pay the vendor versus the cost you pay for people to, in, your, in your system to operate it. So you pay a vendor to do something for you. They supply presumably the, the software, the operating environment and, and the hardware. Um, these days, and then, but then you still have to manage it and run it, and you have a lot. And depending on the vendor, you have different kinds of work you have to do, and so that's what the reflection of that cost was. And again, I want to emphasize it's highly subjective, and it varies in different things. However, you know, it is consistent with what I hear from many. Okay. Next question: Not to put words in your mouth, but the way you describe the ecosystem, it sounds like it's kind of solved in the future's optimizations over the coming years. That just results in relational being the answer. With that in mind, what is left to be solved? Oh my God, no. Oh my God, no. I mean, look, I think that this, this is a time where more interesting things are happening in data. Look, I, I had only 30 minutes to talk about this. I didn't talk about operational databases. I'm also involved in fauna and what's happening there and the world of global operational databases where everything is changing. There's the edge. Let's talk about the whole edge and what's gonna happen there as things get closer and clouds come closer to, 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 to people. And particularly as robots start moving around and latency is super important, There's, that's very critical. But even in that analytics side, that hybrid is broken. I mean, it, it is just broken. I was at Snowflake. I used to watch what our customers do. It's crazy. You take a, a relational data source and you transform it into, into a, a feature matrix. So you build this feature matrix, which, which often is much larger than the source data. And it is lossy. You've lost information because the relations cannot be fully expressed in that feature matrix. And then you put huge amounts of CPU against trying to calculate this. There really are better ways to do this. I mean, the, if you are able to relationally optimize this, you can have incredible orders of magnitude efficiency. So I think it's a whole new world coming up. I mean, my view is, is that this world's going to change dramatically and that we're barely, and, and in essence, um, so I think to some extent, the, the industry is, you know, is polishing the buggy whip with the, with the, the uh, hybrid approach. But, but that approach is going to be dominant for the next three to five years until the next technology is able to, to come in. So I think it's a super interesting time. Do you have an opinion on the future of metadata, especially in the context of complex data? Oh, metadata is everything. Well, metadata of data, metadata is part of data, first of all. And, and, and it, it, it's available to describe the data. And a great deal of the interesting aspects of what we do with data is taking data out of complex things and putting it in metadata that's then accessible. Um, almost all the interesting stuff in data involves metadata. I can sure tell you as a database guy, it, you know, the, the secrets of Snowflake are all about managing the metadata that describes the data. And I think that's true for the next generation of apps. Think about what happens when, you know, images are snapped by, by, by a, a, a technician and the x-ray is immediately analyzed by an ML algorithm, which provides that, that, that report to the doctor. And of course, it's in the system that he can then edit and annotate, he or she can. It's just so fascinating. That's metadata. That's all metadata. So related metadata question, love the visual about enterprise knowledge graph. What's your position on people being part of the graph and how do we do a better job of joining to the metadata they uniquely have? Well, people are, people are connected into the graph because we are, we're a key part of it, right? And if, you know, certainly many of these knowledge graphs are all about people. When you, look at the, when you look at what the LinkedIn knowledge graph is, it's a people graph. Many of them are not. Many of them are about business process and they link together. The thing I think that's fascinating, and this is, I, I, again, I, this is, this is, 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 it's a little early and a little nascent to do the full talks, but, but over time, this will become more and more, more uh, 
detailed. But the thing that, that's interesting is these knowledge graphs combine both the data with the business logic together. And if implemented, if implemented in its fullest extent you, with the full relational calculus, especially when you add recursion onto that, which is a pretty natural add, uh, you, can impl you can really have a, a system that can support the full business model. Business modeling has been around for 50 years, but it never has had a back end that had the semantics to fully express the models. When I did the first business modeling I've ever done, which was in the early 1980s, it generated COBOL code. That it was a COBOL code generator. And of course that was a stupid thing to do and those things were totally unmaintainable. We're now approaching the point where the, the system is, is growing to have the semantics to support the fullness of the logic of the business model. And when that happens, we're gonna see a dramatic shift in the efficiency of business. I think it's the biggest of, efficiency shift we'll see. So I'm excited about where it's going. I don't, not exactly sure when it's gonna get here. Okay. Uh, moving up the stack, the data platform technology seems way ahead of the mainstream business SaaS apps that ride on top of it. Do you see legacy apps utilizing the new technology or do you think net new business apps will need to be created or- well, They'll leverage it. I mean, you know, you, you can't create net new business apps that quickly. I mean, the, 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 the investment in these underlying business applications is so significant that, that it, it's almost impossible to, to rewrite them very quickly. I mean, you can, but it takes many years. So what you can do is you can augment things. You can pull that data out. Um, using that sort of pipeline I described, you can pull data out of those, the, those business applications. And then that data can be used by the SaaS company um, as, a, as a new business. A, lot part, a large part of what we were talking to and, and the Snowflake team still talks to customers about is leveraging um, an advanced cloud analytics solution like Snowflake so that they can make the data within their SaaS applications available to their customers through data sharing. And that, you know, that mechanism is a, is a great mechanism that, 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 that enables that. There are other approaches to data sharing. Snowflakes is particularly, inefficient, particularly efficient. So, I mean, we saw the Salesforce acquisition of Slack last week, week before. They talked a lot about exactly that, yet they went out and bought a chat app. Any thoughts on what it would take a company like Salesforce or anybody else that wants to realize that with an existing set of apps? Well, Salesforce can, you know, there was certainly rumors and conversations about Salesforce buying Snowflake at one point in time. And had they been able to do that, it would have been a good combination for sales. Financially, it seems difficult at this point. At this point, it might be a little challenging for them. It might be a little challenging, a little bit, a little bit, a little, they, 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 it'd, be, it'd be, you know, the, the snake eating the, eating the elephant sort of thing. But um, the, uh, the, it, that's a, it was a good match if they if they could do it, and in fact they can do it as partners as well. And I and I would you know I would hope they do that. Um, and I think that you'll see that happening a lot, where we, these data platforms become uh, infrastructure that helps applications reach a broader audience, solve business problems they couldn't solve, and generate a bit more revenue for them. It's an interesting question. I'm sort of a big fan of consolidation of the SaaS space being inevitable. Um, is it more likely to work where people are going to integrate these existing apps or do you bet on somebody who's going to build it out on the new platforms from, from scratch? Well, you know, I, I, I agree with you that, 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 that these, there are these big application aggregator companies, Salesforce is one of them, Adobe, you could argue Microsoft, well, you know, yeah. certainly Oracle, um, you know, there's a bunch of them. Uh, and 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 they all have they all kind of have one of one of their want their own data platform. People are on one of these five platforms, and I think ultimately all these vendors have to have some way to participate with all of them. So if I'm on you know if I'm on the Google platform or I'm on the Amazon platform or I'm on the Snowflake platform or the Databricks platform, I'm going to want to have access to data because getting data into your external data into your environment will become very very common. I mean it is. To solve, to ask many of the questions people want to ask, you need data both from the business applications you're, that you that you employ, as well as third-party data that, that that is often used to to complete your analysis for marketing purposes and otherwise. This may be further afield from the database world, but any thoughts on OpenAI and the the results with GPT three? Fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating showing what how how much can be done. 
you know, of course, the interesting thing with GPT-3 is, you know, I mean, the level of semantics associated with this is always, is always kind of interesting. Perhaps it can finish the blogs you were describing, Charles, but what I'm not really sure. My dream, really sure. if anybody can I'm get not sure it'll do it with the same level of, I'm not sure it'll have the same wit that you that you were able to come up with. I should hope not. It would be very sad, actually. I, I, I'd love it, to replace by That'd be robot. sad if, if, if there was something that was as snarky and witty as you as you are. That'd be kind of a you, sad thing. The Twitter corpus and you uh, Get, get along as the, you know if you if you if you did do ml over twitter you could probably be you would probably be very rude and snarky and yeah, yeah. That, that would be the corpus i'd go for um what kind of companies do you like investing in and being on the board of i'm trying to be pretty focused because uh i'm not doing a lot of very a lot of investments i have on three boards right now um I, you know, it's it, they take time and i care about them i i treat them seriously and i spend time with my companies and part of one of the things I I like to do is help people. I mean, my reason for being here is is to help develop infrastructure and do things that that can help companies and people be more effective. And so I want to use my time more appropriately. And I think my time is probably more important than my money. And and so so that's where I put my focus. So it's pretty narrow. It's pretty narrow. But I like talking to folks. Well, you have a, a pretty good view of the future too. So working to make that happen makes a ton of sense. Um, this is a question we were talking about before we actually started, but how can a company maintain a relevant position in the tech industry? The big three in tech, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon have stayed relevant for a long time now. That's, that's still kind of a short time horizon, but uh, thoughts on, on how to stay relevant? Absolutely. It's very simple, super simple. And really, it's Jeff Bezos that I think got it right from the beginning, and it's focus on the customer. It's always all about the customer. You know, when you deliver a service, the, when I started at Microsoft, we, we delivered floppy disks. Um, we did deliver, and it was a very, you know, it was, it was a very remote thing. You know, you handed, you handed the disks over to Canyon Park at the time who manufactured them. And um, this was before CD-ROMs even. And, and it really wasn't until you start running a service that you have that intimate relationship with your customer. And I felt this very viscerally at Snowflake that, that, that everything we did, as I said, we had to earn our customers' business every day of the week. Every single day we woke up and had to earn their business. And that you have to do for a long time. And I think the services world both provides the opportunities for major companies to have longevity you know, for another 100 years and because they can become like utilities if they're servicing their customers. And they can also disappear in just a, a flash of the pan if they don't do that. And I think most companies don't put that focus in the right place. Okay, one last detailed question. Single versus multi statement in transactions, I assume means how much disparate data a single transaction can touch and have any deep guarantees? No, not exactly. It's a consistency statement about, it's a consistency statement in this case between, ta between tables. The question is when you're trying to update, you know, it's the debit credit thing, right? If it, it's the most simple, it's the most simple example. It's the classic simple example. If you take money out of one account, you got to put it in the other account. You have to make sure it's put in there fully. That requires multi-statement transactions. It's pretty much that simple. And, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. And, and the thing about this, and this, the thing about transactionality and transaction consistency is that is that whenever you're working with financial data, which you pretty much are doing with most business oriented queries, you need transactional consistency. And people just forget it. They just, every, you know, every time a new, you know, oh, no SQL, you know, oh yeah, consistency. Oh, we'll think about that later. No, bad idea, very bad idea. There's a reason C comes first in the cap theorem. Is that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's just a reason it exists too. And it's a reason databases are hard. It, there's a reason for this. And people do this very, they build a data store without realizing they're building a, what is actually a transactional database without the transactional capabilities built in. And it happens again and again and again. And the result is aberrant behavior in the application. We'll have you back and do a deep dive on Mongo another time. That's a place uh, to start on that. So we, we promised people we'd give them a couple minutes before the end of the hour. So Bob, thanks, that was really great. A um, couple of closing items, please go to feedback.cloudcitymeetup.com right now. Give us feedback, let us know who else we should talk to. We'll have a recording and Bob's slides up on cloudcitymeetup.com in a few days. And we'll be back in the new year with more events. So sign up on cloudcitymeetup.com so that you get notified. Thanks for joining us today.